Here, let me provide some basics about Kaibab, right? just hard evidence, so you know what I'm talking about. In the future, uh, uh, later time, I can elaborate on that. But here are some basic facts about Kaibab. Right? So Kaibab, why it was called Kaibab Canon, the reason is that it was produced during the first emperor's reign, the southern so, uh, northern Song Dynasty, right? The Zhao, Zhao Kuang Yin, right? So his reign name is Kaiba. So because it was carved during that time, it has been referred to as a Kaiba Canon. Right? Also, because it was created during the Song Dynasty, it has been called Song Canon. Right? Some other names like Shu edition. Shu is another name for Sichuan. Just to give it an identity, give it an identity. Uh, Japanese would like to call that imperial edition, uh, imperial edition. Right? Uh, then this canon was printed <coughs> during the Kaibao reign from 971 to 983, right? about 12 years, carved during uh, 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 in uh, Chengdu, right? Sichuan, and uh, uh, moved to the capital Kaibao right? after its completion. And there's some other information we know from examining the existing copies, right? The typical Kaibao uh, format is like 23 columns per page. Right? If you call the page a sheet of paper, right? a scroll is uh, multiple sheets of paper pasted together. Right? So one sheet of paper, you have 23 columns and 14 characters per column. Uh, you probably, if you don't compare, you don't. You probably don't know. This is actually showing the characters actually very large. They have a fewer characters in a column, right? So then the traditional ones, such as Dunhuang manuscript, right? We usually have 17 characters, right? but this one has 14, which means the character itself actually become bigger. So later we're, we're going to talk about Sichuan prints. Sichuan prints at that time were famous for their bigger characters. So this is perhaps a Sichuan characteristic, and the characters are bigger. Right? Uh, so it's a scroll, right? just like the sample I handed to you is a scroll. Right? It's a scroll. So initial content, right? we know it follows Zhisheng's catalog, the standard catalog. It's about 5,048 fascicles, right? 1,076 titles in 480 cases. Right? This is standard structure. Of course, in the later time, supplements has been made. Right? Supplements have been made. Right? Uh, so there are continuous supplementation until uh, 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 the late later Northern Song Dynasty. Right? Uh, some other texts have been added. Right? Roughly, we, because we don't have the complete canon in our hand, we don't have access to that. So estimate goes is probably 6,962 fascicles. Right? about 682 cases, right? probably around that number. Right? Nobody can tell if that's the real uh, number. Right? We have estimates. Right? But I have only 13. Right? We have 12 of them reproduced. Right? Uh, so maybe only 12. Right? I, I have to find out why some sources said, said there's 13. Uh, what, what, what is interesting about this uh, canon is that Immediately after it was produced, it has become a gift, right? During the national international diplomacy, uh, when the Japanese monks came and then the Koreans came for a diplomatic reason, this canon has become a gift to be given to those uh, uh, countries, right? And the uh, people love it. The people from this country, they just love it, and they want more. So we see the record showing they came repeatedly just for the canon. They like it, right? and they thought it's a marvelous uh, uh, enterprise, and they want to imitate that. They want to imitate that. So there's some kind of a strength and power uh, in this kind of a compilation. The first printed one. I guess the technology, just like the digital technology, people just were really kind of surprised by uh, the use of printing for the production, the massive scale of the project. So this is something we're going to talk about later. And uh, let, let's go over the first topic I want to uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, examine. Right? So first about early Song. Right? When the Song Dynasty was founded, 
uh, we have to understand the predecessor of the Song, which is the regional uh, power, we call the later Zhou Dynasty. Right? They call them this dynasty, but it's never a unified country. China was displayed into 10 smaller kingdoms. So this is one bigger one in the north, uh, called the Shizong. He actually initiated persecution. He personally doesn't like Buddhism. He doesn't like Buddhism. Right? And uh, the founder of the Song Dynasty, Taizu, at that time was actually a general and the Shizong. He was a general and the Shizong. So Shuzong initiated this program to systematically not to eliminate the Buddhism, but, but just limit the development of Buddhism. For example, he ordered no building of a, a bronze statue of Buddha. Right? So all the bronze statues should be sent to the capital to be melted, to be made into coins, weapons, something else. Right? But we see the rain year, only four years he died. And you probably fancy imagine what the reason could be. One reason could be he persecuted Buddhism. Right? Whenever you did something bad to Buddhism, you die quickly. Right? Uh, so then the new emperor, uh, Taizu, he was Shizong's general. He actually basically he overthrown, not overthrown, but just took over the power. Right? And uh, established new dynasty, he changed the policy. Right? This time favored the Buddhism. Right? Uh, there's something else about uh, uh, Buddhism, not only the canon was carved, but also translation activities have been revived. Right? We know Tang Dynasty is a great period for translation, but that's, that was stopped for a long time. And the Song Emperor, they ascend to the throne, they, they have the cultural ambition to uh, revive that. So they send monks to India. So they send monks to India to invite Indian monks to come to China. Of course, the condition is that bring texts bring Buddhist sutras. And they establish a, uh, a, a, a translation institute devoted to translation. Right? Later we will see this translation institute is closely related to the creation of Kaiba. Because when the sutra has been translated, it will be immediately included into the canon. Into the canon. Uh, also, there are multiple legends about the founding of the Song Dynasty. Right? Somebody say the Song Emperors, they are reincarnations of Buddha. Right? Uh, so then we can see uh, they have been blessed. So this new dynasty has been blessed. Most important is that this, the Song Emperors, two of them in the early time, one is Taizu, another is Taizu, their brothers, uh, they advocated a cultural policy largely shaped the Song culture which is emphasized what we call the wen, right? which means culture, if you know the Chinese character, uh, culture, right? so that's it. Right? So Song Dynasty has been regarded as one of the splendid culturally uh, accomplished uh, dynasty in Chinese history. Right? Maybe that's because the early Song emperors, especially the second one, right? the younger brother is, is Taizu, right? after the Taizu. Uh, so they start translation, so this is related to when the culture. Uh, they start uh, printing, they use printing not just for British canon, but for producing uh, 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 Confucian classics and the literary collections. They did lots of this, right? more, more than uh, uh, hundreds of volumes. Right? Uh, so largely the Song culture right, has been shaped by such kind of atmosphere. Right? You probably remember some great Song poets. Su Dong Po, Su Shi, right? Ouyangshu, right? All these people that actually live in this environment, cultivated by that, and contributed to the culture. Right? And the Buddhist canon, Indian Buddhist canon, is part of that. Right? It's part of that. Okay. So this uh, big fat guy, right? So he's a Taizu, the, the founder, right? Kind of ugly. Right? He, he's really black, uh, uh, not that handsome. Uh, so he was the founder, uh, basically um, a military general. Uh, so he, there, there are lots of uh, legends surrounding him about why he overthrew the later Zhou dynasty. Right? Uh, so here is the portrait of him. Right? The second one is the second emperor, the brother. Right? This one actually is a real literary figure. Right? I'm not saying he's a poet or author or something, but he, he likes books. Right? He likes books a lot. And he, uh, he had to read, literally read. Right? We have been discussing, you know, nobody reads things seriously. This is one of the emperors, uh, 
after we finish it. Right? So he asked his uh, 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 officials to compile a uh, encyclopedia, a collection of, 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 of uh, uh, Asian books. And he said to them, I will read one volume every day. Right? And he did. And the fi he finished it, this and called this Tai Ping Yu Lan. Right? The, the imperially, the emperor read books during the Tai Ping Xingguo reign. During his rulership, he actually read it every day. He said, I, I every day read that. Right? Not only that, he read Buddhist scriptures. Right? He actually wrote uh, his own work to praise Buddhism, Buddhist teaching. And that writing has been incorporated into the canon. Right? He, he took care of the project, of course, but he has written, got inside the canon. So he actually read, uh, had written quite a bit of a Buddhist work, but doesn't make quite a lot of sense because that's basically poets, uh, eulogy to praise Buddha. Right? So that those got preserved in Korean canon. Right? In Korean canon, now we have a reprint. Uh, so this is a second emperor. Right? I said, you see, he is uh, better looking right? than than his brother. Okay, so this is a map of the Song Dynasty right? because we want to situate the uh, canon in history and the community and the culture. Then here is the boundary of the Song Dynasty, right? That is the largest territory possible. And you see, you can see here, this is the uh, modern day Chinese boundary. Then you can see this is absolutely uh, not the entire China, but this is a, what we call the China proper. Right? This Han Chinese usually occupy this region. But however, in the north, we have Liao, right? This is actually Kidan. I frequently mentioned, under the Kidan rule, a canon was also produced, but slightly later than the Kaiba canon. It, it was also printed, by the way. Right? Because the Liao people, the Kidan people, later occupied Beijing right, at the time. So they have the manpower and the master technology. Uh, and Koryo is here. Right? Koryo here. This is uh, Korean. Right? This is Korean. Right? Peninsula here. And the late, late next time when we talk about Koryo Canon, we, we will talk about more about its relationship with Kidan. Actually, that, that's very important for the making of the Koryo Canon. And what happened in the year 1126 is that uh, the, the Kidans invaded and captured the Song Emperor. The Emperor captured brought to the north, and the, the border has been drawn here, and the, 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 the Song government retreated to Hangzhou. So Hangzhou became a capital. So the borderline now changed like this. So usually we call the Song government before 1126 Northern Song. And after this year, that become Southern Song, right? And the, for places, you can see here is Chengdu, right? So this is a place Kaibao Canon was carved. Right? The carving project is finished here, and the uh, printing project, right, is actually moved here. The capital is Kaifeng, right? By the way, the reason why the the the, uh, the, the Northern Song Dynasty fell to the Kidan. One of the reasons is they, they, they chose the bad place to be their capital. Right? It's a bad choice because you can see it's, it's located in the central plain. There's basically no natural barrier. No mountains protect them. So if you invade it, it's all the way come down here, and you can capture the capital city. It's a bad choice. So in the, in the later time, very few dynasties, no, nobody actually chose this place. Right? So I, I lived in this city called Luoyang for a long time. Right? Almost uh, my entire childhood I lived here. And you can see there are mountains, right? Chang'an is even safer right? because it's surrounded by mountains. And then we have a Chengdu here, right? You see here, this is Sichuan. Right? Sichuan is also a safer place because it is surrounded by a mountain. The only way you can get out is either go to north, right? To uh, Shanxi, the southern Shanxi, and go to Kaifeng, or go down through the Yangtze River, right? Go down through the Yangtze River, then connected with South China. Right? 
Otherwise, it's actually very difficult to get out. Right? So it's a, historically speaking, it's a very safer place. Uh, then Chengdu, right? Kaifeng, Hangzhou, right? so these are the major places we're going to refer to. And outside this borderline, you have Tibetans, of course, here. And one of the uh, regional power we're going to mention this is Xia. Right? So this is what you usually call the Tungurs. Right? The Tungurs is a minority group. They became very strong during that time, and they established their own uh, government, right? their own power. And it became very powerful. Uh, one thing about the culture achievement is that they produce a police cannon. But unfortunately, it's not in Chinese. It's, uh, it's in their own scripts. They devised their own scripts. Right? But because we study the Chinese Buddhist canon, which means classical Chinese, we, we didn't study that. But I already definitely influenced by the Kaiba Kaiba OK. So let's move to uh, this region called Sichuan. Right? So this is a very interesting place. Right? Uh, I study Kaiba Canyon, and I got interested in Sichuan. Right? So I've been there only once. But uh, Sichuan is such a marvelous place. Uh, the reason why it became the, 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 the place for carving Kaibao Cannon, simply because before this, Sichuan already become, be, became a printing center. Right? The earliest uh, printing samples discovered actually mostly came from Sichuan province, came from Sichuan. Right? So it's perhaps the first major area uh, 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 conquered by the new Song Dynasty. Uh, I said Song Dynasty is a regional power. Right? Uh, it inherits the later Zhou Dynasty, probably around this area, but it's only part. Then the Song Dynasty launches expeditions to different area. The first target is Sichuan. Right? So this is the reason why the Kaibao was not carved in Hangzhou. Actually, it's another printing center. So it was not probably in Hangzhou, but I actually started in Sichuan because the, 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 the Song Emperor just sent his generals to conquer Sichuan first. The process proved to be such a fast process because the, the Sichuan ruler, local lord, just surrendered. And later, something else happened. His generals abused the power, killed a lot of captives. So then there's a revolt. Uh, so, so we don't know exactly what happened, but very soon, the uh, order has been made to create a Buddhist community. In Chengdu, which is the capital city in the region, right? and also a pretty center. Right? Uh, so, for example, right. So here is the example of an early uh, uh, print material. We don't call this a book. Right? This is a uh, Dharani, right? the print of a Dharani with the squiggle Sanskrit with the Buddha figure in the center, probably for the purpose of. Uh, uh, to be used as a talisman, right? Put on the wall or somewhere. And I don't know detail about this, but this is uh, early evidence of printed material. And uh, I didn't translate this, but it looks like they are uh, print shops, private print shops called BM family. Uh, they specialize in the printing. And it gives you the name, uh, the, the, the uh, street name of the location of this uh, print shop, right? which shows the printing uh, industry in Sichuan, Chengdu, right? has reached such a uh, level. So then we want to understand how it was carved. Right? So in all the literatures, the Kaibao canon in Sichuan is very ambiguous. Right? The history, how it was carved, is almost no literature covers that. Right? And uh, the only sources we have so far came from three or four reference to the carving in standard or Buddhist uh, chronologies, uh, chronologies. The first one, I regarded this one as the most important, right, is actually uh, a print version of Bei Shan Lu, right, the record on Northern Mountain by a Tang Dynasty monk called Shen Qing. Right? You probably wonder who's Tang Dynasty. Right? So it's nothing to do with Song. Well, however, this copy, when it was printed during the Northern Song, it was commentated by a Chengdu monk. Right? This guy is coming from Chengdu, called Huifa. 
what he did is that he annotated Shen Qing's work right? in one note. Right? He gave us the number of the Kaibao blocks. The Kaibao blocks, which has been carved at that time, is 130,000 blocks. This is a passing reference. He didn't say how it was carved or whatever. He said, okay, emperor has ordered to carve, and we have this number. So this piece of information is very important because this only this becomes the source for all the reference later to uh, document the number of blocks. Right? So this record, I believe, is very important. So then we have the, the Buddhist chronology, this one, but we look at the year. Hui Bao's work, he, Hui Bao was contemporary of the, the early Song. And so he, he actually was there in Chengdu when Kai Bao was carved. But however, the later record came from much later, right, in 1269, right, so almost uh, 200 years later. Right. But however, that document gives names. Right. Uh, this emperor sent this unit to Kaifeng and supervised the project. Right. And the later edition gave us more names about what's going on here, and it gave us the number of blocks. And this number comes actually from Huibao's record. Uh, Huibao's record. So then, after some more study, as we have uh, some bold hypothesis of what's going on in uh, Sutra, uh, in Chengdu, because we did more study of Huibao. Right? Huibao, this monk, according to his biography, appended to the back of uh, uh, Beishan Lu, the record of North Mountain, Actually, he said they live in Cao Xuanting, right, which is uh, the, the resident of the Yangsheng, a Han Dynasty uh, uh, literati. But uh, he, that residence became, during that time, the Zhongxingzi. So he was a monk there. Right? And the, 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 it shows Hui Bao was a literary monk. Right? So he actually witnessed the production of Kai Bao during that time. And uh, what very interesting is that we find a, a reference to Kaibao in a later time by a monk called Zhang Xue Tongzui. This is much later in the 17th century. Right? Uh, at this point, we're not sure if his remarks are right on, uh, is uh, right or wrong. Because he was writing, actually, for an inscription uh, of the installation of the canon at a temple called the Shangdu Temple. Right. From there, actually, we discover an edition of Hong Wu Nanza, right? so the southern edition of the Hong Wu Wei. Right? But uh, however, Zhang Xue Tongzui, when he wrote this inscription for that uh, uh, place, he actually mistaken the canon as Kaibao canon. He didn't got it right. right? But when he referred to the Kaibao uh, uh, canon, he actually said, all the blocks of Kaibao have been preserved in the Wanfu temple, or the Wanfu temple, or called Jingyin in Chengdu. Right? So we did some research after this is a number, uh, this is all the names of the uh, temple in the Tang dynasty called Jingzhong. Right? If you study Zen history, this temple is not an ordinary temple because it's represent one branch of Zen Buddhism we call the Jingzhong and the Baotang tradition in Sichuan. It was founded by a Korean monk called Wuxiang. This monk came from Korea. He was a Korean, but right? stayed in China. Right? So, uh, so it is highly likely, and the Jingzhong Monastery, there are some other hypotheses about Jingzhong Monastery, because it has connection with government printing. So another interesting hypothesis is that actually the paper money, the Chinese used the paper money for the first time during the Song Dynasty. It was actually created in the Jingzhong Monastery. Uh, Jingzhong Monastery. So we're talking about a monastery which has a specialized kind of a job of printing. Right? And also there's a reference pointing to this monastery as a place where the blocks are stored. So at this point, we have this hypothesis that the Jingzhong Monastery is likely to become the place where the Kaibao Canon has been carved. Right? Of course, we need more evidence. But very likely in the early Song Dynasty, for such kind of a project, you need to rely on monks. Right? Rely on the monks or the monastery to, uh, uh, to 
manage the, the, the project. Right? And we are talking about uh, 130,000 blocks. Right? So this is a, a kind of an enormous job right, to accomplish. OK, so then let's move to Kaipon. Right? So what happened in Kaipon? Right? In Kaipon, the history of Kaipa in Kaipon is actually much clearer right, than its history in Sichuan. Right? And one thing about uh, uh, Sichuan is that right after uh, Kaipa Canyon was transported, a major rebellion occurred in Sichuan, right? Wang Xiaobo Li Shun. Right? Actually, they, they sacked Chengdu. Right? They just invaded Chengdu and burned a lot of things, including Jingzhong Temple. Uh, of course, the temple was rebuilt. Right? So lots of record has been burned. So we don't know exactly what happened during that time. Right? Uh, but in Kaifeng, we know pretty sure uh, when the cannon, uh, the blocks being transported, it has been put in uh, this institute called Translation Institute. Right? I mentioned the early Song Emperors, they were so eager to have uh, 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 cultural accomplishments, so he invited Indian monk to translate. Right? So part of the function of uh, translation institute is to take care of the blocks and print them. Uh, print them right? Of course, they have a, a printing office. A printing office. Uh, then you can see all this process, right? Translation, new catalog, uh, new translation being carved in this institute, then printed. Right? So this happened until 1072. After that year, what happened is that Song government never wanted to manage that. It's, it cost lots of money, human resources. So they return the blocks to a Buddhist temple in Kaifeng. Right. So you can see the prints coming from uh, Kaifeng during that time. They all come from the Xiansheng Temple. Right? Xiansheng temple. Right. So that's the place the later uh, Northern Song Dynasty took care of the Kaifeng. Right. Let me show you some examples. Harvard University, once again, uh, we have a piece of a uh, Kaiba. I, I, I'm not sure if it belongs to Kaiba or not, because it does not have uh, the character from the Southern Character Essay, but we're pretty sure this is part of the Kaiba, right? Because according to the record, this is called Mi Zhang Quan, right? Uh, interpretation of the Secret Teaching uh, Sutra uh, has been written by Taizong Emperor, the second emperor. Right? So he was an emperor, and we have a clear record, Taizong Emperor says, this got to be into the canon. Right? So we're pretty sure that's being brought into canon. The reason why it does not have Southern uh, character there, uh, we still don't know. Right? But we're pretty sure uh, this the cover has five pieces, right? five copies right? of different pages. Right? This is one of them. We have a painting here. Right? Uh, a Harvard professor wrote a book just on this painting, a book to introduce uh, because this is probably the earliest landscape wood carved painting, right? So it's very precious for study art history. So the professor wrote a book study art history, not about the canon. Not about the canon. Uh, by the way, we also know this has been reprinted in Korean canon, right? The first edition of Korean canon has the front of his uh, uh, painting. But the second reprint, right, in the second edition, we don't have the printings. Right? We do have the text, but don't have the printing. Right? So this is the text. You can see the bigger, larger size uh, characters. These are Emperor Taizong's writing. Uh, not his writing, but his composition. Poems. And the smaller characters are commentaries uh, by eminent monks. In order eminent monks to give commentaries to his own works, right? And uh, for him, this is fun. A lot of fun to write this kind of uh, 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 composition. So, so he wrote a lot. Actually, it doesn't make much sense. Actually, it's not about Buddhist teaching, but it's all about uh, uh, kind of interesting, uh, the poem, he praised Buddha, praised Buddhism, let's go on and on, right? I actually read, read this. I want, because I want to know, is there any new information about the creation of the uh, Kaiba. Okay, so let's let's look at the structure of a Kaiba. Right? It's quite straightforward that Kaiba follows uh, the standard catalog. Right? Uh, uh, so this is no problem. Right? But however, after Kaiba was brought to Kaifeng, actually there are three major supplements. Right? Three major supplements. 
One happened in 999, which right? is uh, shortly after it was transported, because there are translations in the Tang Dynasty which have which was not which were not included in Zhishang's catalog. So those got supplemented first. So then there's a second supplement, right, from uh, 100,000 to 1073. Simply new translations, some Chinese writings. I mentioned Qi Song, right, his work in there. The third supplement around 1105 to 1108. Again, Chinese writings in Kentai, Huayan, uh, Chan Buddhism, in which are. Right? Uh, at the end of the Kaibao, history of Kaibao, it becomes so lousy, right, nobody wants to take care of there. And we have some texts which simply uh, outsourced to some commercial prints, right? uh, print shops. Uh, and we see rocks actually not of great quality uh, and with different kind of formats, which shows the court may just send people go to the commercial print shop and purchase their block. Right? They don't cover anymore, but they purchase blocks from other people. So I have a table here, right, give you different estimates of the size of Kaibao. Because previous scholars, they all did studies about Kaibao. However, as I said, because we don't have the complete version, then we have uh, different numbers here, estimates about its size, right? Each supplement, exactly how many texts been put inside, that's, that's still uh, a mystery for us, okay. So then I want to uh, speak about the quality of Kaibao, right? because uh, I say we have the fortune of uh, 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 having Korean monk Sugi's collation notes. Uh, I mentioned this is very precious to us. Right? Here I can just speak uh, very uh, quickly, because this study is based on actually Robert Buswell's study. Right? So in March, he came here basically uh, uh, just uh, report to us this study. Right? So he published a long article. Right? So I think here it's worthwhile to uh, repeat some of his findings. Right? Uh, so I just list the major problems and give you examples later if we have time. Right? So first it's about a complete or partial omission of the text. Right? So when Sugi compared the text, he, he find okay, the, 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 some text at one point just stop. Next paragraph, they didn't connect each other. And he was able to see the Liao Dynasty, the Kidan version. And he compared. And find the Kidan version is probably more com complete. Then he noted that and tell us in the Song Dynasty version, which is Kaibao, something is missing. Right? So he identified this is a, a one kind of a problem. Second is disordered transposition. The text there, but not in the right order, not in the right order, and he tried to correct those. Third one is dithography, which means repetition. Right? Some phrases or works has been repeated, repeated. Right? It shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be there. Right? Number four is erroneous attribution of authors, titles, and the classical numbers. It's just kind of a, uh, crazy mistakes uh, about titles. This author should be should belong to that title, but I ever they got messed up, mess up. Right? So this kind of scholarship is actually very meticulous, right? So most of us do not have the energy to do that, but looks like Sugi, this great monk, actually read at least uh, absolutely the entire canon and the two canons at his hand. He actually had the first edition of the Goryeo canon, uh, Kidan canon, and the Kaibao canon. So he has three canons, and he, he wrote 30 volumes, right? To document these mistakes, these mistakes, right? Of course, Kidan canon also has mistakes, but fewer mistakes, fewer mistakes. And we have some examples, right? I think probably these are too narrow and uh, meticulous, probably not, we cannot uh, talk about in details, right? But they all listed here. These are examples, not all of them. So you can see from the list, then what's the problem in which sutra? Right? Uh, that, that's that's going to be interesting to look at. Right? Okay. So uh, we're approaching the end of this lecture. Right? Then we want to say something about the influence of Kaibao during that time. Right? It's actually a, a significant event in the history of the canon formation. Right? Uh, 
because immediately after it was brought to Kaifeng, to remember the year is 983. And here we're talking about a year later, a Japanese monk called Chunen arrived in Kaifeng. Right? Then the canon was given to Chunen. Right? He brought that back to Japan. Right? The major event, the entire canon. We're talking about the entire canon. And then another monk called Jiujin right, came uh, uh, about 100 years later. He requests the supplement because we know the canon has been supplemented. Right? And between, we know at that time, the Koryo dynasty has the most frequent connection with the Northern Song because they want to, to, to form a alliance to resist Kidan invasion. The Kidans invade Northern Song and also Koryo. Right? So at the one time, the two uh, Song China and the Koryo Korea want to unite it together. Right? So they have more frequent cultural exchange. And during that time, eight editions, eight times, the canon has been brought to uh, Korea. Right? So the Koreans actually, in their court, they have at least eight copies. Eight copies. Right? Uh, and also the canon was given to Tungers, the Xia, the Xi Xia, right? I point to the map to the uh, west. That's the newly rising power. And uh, they received the cannon. We don't know how, if this inspired them to uh, carve their own cannon. Right? But it looks like it's crazy. People are crazy about cannon. They want to get a copy. Or they want to produce by themselves. And Vietnam also received at least eight times. We have a historical record. We don't have the real stuff right? preserved. Right? Uh, and Vietnamese, as far as I know, never produced their own cannon, but however, they did receive cannons from China, right? Maybe from other places, we don't know. So that's the area we actually need to do more research, right? And even the Jurchens, right, in the north, the Jurchens replaced Kidan, right, later. They also request the cannon. Right? But sadly, the Jurchen later conquered North China, right? So what happened is that they marched into Kaifeng, actually they looted the entire city, especially the books. They won the books and the blocks, they brought the blocks actually according to some records back to the north. And then we don't know where they are. Then we, that's the end of the Kaibal Canyon. Because the blocks been either destroyed or put it somewhere, then there's no history of prints. No prints ever after 1126, the fall of the Northern Song Dynasty or Kaifeng City. Right? We don't know about that. So that's the end of the Kaibal. Right? Let's see some. Uh, screenshots, right? So this is a piece I showed you before, right? And uh, uh, the character, if you count it, that's going to be 14, right? 23 all through uh, here column. So this one is the title. And we have the year here clearly printed. So help us to identify this is actually from the Kaibao ring. So then it must be Kaibao Canyon. And the way is uh, southern character here, right? So we can identify it as coming from Canon. And we know at that time only Kaibao Canon was called, right? During the Song Dynasty, Northern Song. But later, there are other canons being carved in the south. Right? So this is another copy, right? However, right, in this recent years, there are efforts to reproduce the remaining Kaibao Canon because we do have the object of the real Kaibao. So uh, Professor Fang Wangchang, Li Jinying, and a group of people, they, they made this beautiful uh, cabinet with cases here to store the cannon. Right? It's not big, right? but however, beautifully made, but expensive. I asked my library to acquire one, but they said, not only is it is expensive, this is gross. Where are we going to put it? <laughs> right? We put on the staff, there's, there's no way we, we, we put it. Right? So, so I don't know how much, 25, 250,000, it's kind of expensive, right? Uh, so then this is kind of a newly reproduced Kaibao, beautifully made, with the precious materials, paper, uh, uh, cover, these are all very, very precious. Okay, so I think that's going to be the end of my lecture for today. Uh, I have study questions. Uh, which is based on my lecture here, and uh, we, 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 I think we can stop here, right? Uh, this, as I said, Kaibao Canyon is very important, 
and uh, a lot of things we don't know or are not sure about that. But we have enough records, historical records, to reconstruct uh, reconstruct the process of printing. And uh, right now, it's a time for us to uh, estimate or to uh, reflect upon the inference of Kaiba, right? because in the future uh, lecture, Korean canon for the example, they said it's inferenced by Kaiba canon, right? and also other canons made later, made in the later time, also receive such kind of impact. Okay, I think now we can open up to the floor, uh, the students, audience, and see if there's any questions. Did you just say that uh, only 13 fascicles of uh, Kaiba left, but how come later on in the last two pictures you said that there's a reconstruction of uh, Kaiba? Where, where, where did they get it from? They, they, just, they, just, they have this 13, they collect it, they take photo of this, they, they reprint it. Oh, so only 13? Only 13. Oh, okay. You see that cabinet, that's only contains 13, okay. 20, uh, 12 actually. 12 reproduced volume there. But this took lots of effort to make, so it's expensive, expensive. Right? So it's actually not big. I think it's a small cabinet, right? So you have a 12 volume there. Uh, it's for collector's purpose. Uh, yeah, so, so in America, I think Harvey Engine should supposed to have one copy because they landed their copy to the uh, Chinese producer to take photos. So that's the agreement. After it was produced, Harvard will acquire the one. But I went to Harvard, I request that nobody says they know about that. <laughs> so the practically it got lost. And I told this to Professor Li Jinning during the March conference. And he said he's going to investigate that. Because they asked a commercial delivery uh, company to, to deliver that. But Harvard never received it. <laughs> so, so it's somewhere, right? So it's, we don't know. So it's reproduction. reproduction. Only the, the 12 words. I don't know if it's correct, if it's correctly when it refers to the, this current lecture, but in, in trying in my mind to imagine how these these writings were, were used in a practical way mm -hmm. for the average monastics. I would imagine that they would not have access to these these writings. They would be reserved for high level. So much like today, if I want to study the Vimalakirti Sutra, I either buy a copy, or uh, maybe if I, a teacher wants to cover a particular chapter, he may uh, make a copy of just that chapter. A any idea of how how these these scriptures would be used by the average monastics? Are there were there uh, work copies in maybe even inferior quality, but something that they could have to, to actually study with, or was how was that done during okay. those times? So the, that's something I can tell you, right? Because we do know what's happened when uh, the, the Kaibal Canon was put in Kaifun and ready for prints. Uh, you can you can request those prints, and it's in, in great demand. Uh, people want a piece of the entire canon because if you go back and review my previous lecture, I mentioned the building of this gigantic revolving cabinet. That happened at the same time when the Kaiba was constructed and printed. So you see people build such a structure, revolving cabinet, they need something inside, right? <laughs> so then request the cannon. Right? So I, I read something like uh, they even cannot get that, so they still put the manuscript copies inside. They, they ask people to transcribe into the manuscript because it's just either expensive because it's new technology, beautifully printed, or because so many people want it, or it's an imperial edition. So the, the, the canon is in great demand at that time, in some times. But the question is uh, if people want to read it or people just want to put it inside the cabinet. And as I said, it's a money-making business, right? You charge people to push the revolving device, then you earn 
uh, the, the monastery got a profit, the library have got to have something there. Better to be Kaiba, because that's coming from the Catholic. So that's why also the reason we see right after the Kaiba, there are some other private uh, 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 effort has been made to pre produce new editions because they, they don't have enough canon. They want more. Right? They want more. So the building of a revolving uh, cabinet repository is actually one of the, the, the motive, right? the, the demand right? uh, has been created for Kaiba. We were, we're pretty sure it is. it has been kind of distributed wider. And we have even Zen monks they read the Zen Buddhist, uh, read the Kaiba Canon, and the road catalogs, right? So I, you probably didn't notice one slide in the previous lecture, I mentioned Wei Bai, this Zen monk, uh, but however, he actually is a Zen monk, but he read the Kaiba Canon entirely and made a, a annotated catalog, right? So this shows people indeed read the Canon and study, study. Uh, so canon is something probably right now we cannot imagine, but I in ancient time is absolutely uh, a precious uh, uh, object representing the Dharma. So the Dharma, uh, we have uh, the uh, Buddha, right, and the Sangha, and this Buddhist canon represents Dharma. So that's one part of the three uh, refugee you need to keep close to yourself. Okay, I have one from uh, Ronald in uh, New Mexico. Right. I think you know him. Sure, sure, sure. All right, and he would like to know, is there any project to translate or digitize the canon created by the Shia, written in their script, like the projects you mentioned in the earlier lectures of the Goryeo canon and other digitization projects? Uh, I'm not aware of that. I, I don't know if I'm really aware of that. Well, and that well, version, actually, uh, uh, I know probably carved the Sisha, but later in Hangzhou, there are also a project to carve the Sisha canon, right? if I understand correctly, during the Yuan Dynasty, uh, there's some other attempts. But but I'm not sure, do we have the entire canon? Yeah, the most of the uh, documents are kept in Russia. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, well, they are fragmentary, yeah, you can't sure, sure, sure. Or and, and we don't have experts to yeah. identify <coughs> the language. And also, the sad thing is about the script, because the Shisha people, they, they created that, they invented it out of nothing. And, and the thing is that when, when Kublai Khan conquered China and invaded the Shisha, he slaughtered everybody. Right? So this group of people basically disappeared, disappeared in history. So nobody knows their scripts. Uh, of course, right now, scholars, they can, they can figure out. They're dictionaries, by the way, they find out. So they can reconstruct their script, what they mean. But for for understand the entire canon, I think sooner or later, right? I'm looking at all of you, right? Maybe some of you will, will take upon this task and, and study uh, uh, Tonga scripts, and in the future we can understand uh, the Tonga uh, Sisha canon better. Okay, any question about Song Dynasty? Right, so we, we, the purpose of this lecture is not just about introducing the canon, but Song Dynasty, this is a wonderful dynasty, a lot of other things happen. And uh, I think the canon is part of that. Well, I think your question about Chengdu, or Chengdu is my own town. Yeah. And um, I think the end of the, in the end of the Tang Dynasty, Chengdu was comparatively peaceful. and. We often claim that we could be independent <laughs> because uh, the mountains are high, the emperors are far away. What can the emperor do with us? So, in comparison, Sichuan was peaceful, um, so people enjoy a a good life and uh, culture and uh, education continued. So uh, in Dunhuang, we found some documents printed in Chengdu, shipped or transported to yeah. Dunhuang. So we realized that um, the, the, printing, um, the printing enterprise probably in Chengdu was very flourishing in those days. Right. So that's why, well, when 
when the new dynasty was established, everywhere was poor or, well, everywhere needed uh, recovery, so they decided to choose Chengdu, where suddenly 140,000 soldiers surrendered. Yeah. There, was no, there was no war, and, and the emperor decided to choose Chengdu. And, and it's, a, it's a huge uh, project because you have to ship all the 130,000 wood blocks yeah. to Kaifeng. And the road, I, I don't think they, they transported on foot. Mm -hmm. They have to probably ship through boat. Yeah. And uh, probably through boat they transported to Yangzhou yeah. or somewhere. They, then they changed their, changed their route through Grand Canal to Kaifeng. Yeah. Well, I don't know whether we have records about that, yeah, but probably we have to trace. Yeah. That would be very interesting to see yeah. the another thing in the uh, in the beginning of uh, <laughs> of the Song Dynasty, the transportation. Yeah, 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 right. So thank a lot for mentioning this geographical kind of factor. It's about geography here, yeah, yeah, geography. because we know if you want to get out of Sichuan, there are only two ways: either going to the north yeah. by land through the southern Shanxi, and then go from Luoyang that way, uh -huh. all by land, uh, mm -hmm. maybe take advantage of the Yellow River, but that's not, not the main road. Then that's following the Yangtze River. Yeah. You can go to Xiangyang, right, Wuhan, right, and go to north through Xiangyang, and somehow close to Kaifeng or Hana. Or as you said, go all the way down to the Yangtze River and go north again, right, go north mm -hmm against the, the, the ranking now. Mm -hmm. I, I think they have to choose the best season because the Yangtze River, especially the Three Gorges, mm -hmm. well, if you travel there uh, in the summer, it will be dangerous. Yeah, yeah. yeah so they probably, they, I think they probably made good investigation about uh, the safety of their travel because uh, 130,000 wood exactly. blocks, yeah. they are heavy and yeah. uh, uh, it's not so easy. It is never an easy task. Yeah. So it's going. I guess it's going to be some other reference to the Kai Volcanic, right? In some sources, for example, transportation. We know Song Dynasty. They're specialized the government agency to take care of the trans transportation. So there might be some kind of a reference to this event because exactly as you said, it's a huge project, right? Just to mm -hmm. transport the blocks to the capital and the, nothing lost. Looks like it's complete mm -hmm. set, nothing lost, right? Uh, no, no accident or trouble. Yeah, they didn't. So that's that, that, the transportation is in the. It probably it was a miracle yeah. that they could ship all those things from Sichuan to yeah. uh, to to Kaifeng. Yeah. Well, when I, I remember when I travel travel from Beijing to Chengdu, when I cross the Qinming, my ears suddenly yeah. feel uncomfortable. <laughs> it's it it is never easy. Exactly. On land. The mountain after mountain. Yeah, mountain, <coughs> so many mountains. You, you you carry such a heavy heavy wood blocks. Um, it, it is unbelievable. So uh, I I attend a conference and people discuss that. You know, people have donkeys, right? <laughs> so you, you go up to the hill. Donkeys carry things up to the hill. And, and you kind of transport the next station, right, one after another through the lake. But donkeys, they have their, they don't have elephants. I'm not sure elephants being used or not. But donkey can carry only some of them, right? Yeah. And we are talking about lots of donkeys doing that. But boat, the most efficient transportation means actually is by waterway, yeah. donation pipe. Because you have a boat that can carry lots of goods, lots of goods. So very likely they took the waterway. Uh, now, one for monastery probably is well. Now we have. I re, I I checked the uh, one such. Well, when I was young, I would travel. We or sometimes we went to northern part of the city. One for monastery is close to the river, uh, the Brocade yeah, River. Right. Brocade River. So they in ancient times there might be some boats. Well, I, well, many, well, Dufu probably, well, the other day I watched that film, Dufu stayed in Chengdu, and when he, well, he finally decided to leave Sichuan, 
and he probably took the boat. Okay. So you see this monastery called Jingzhong or Wanfu is close to river and then the water, if you want to print, you must need water. Mm -hmm. uh, to make paper printing, water is definitely got to be there. And, uh, and, and I've been looking at the maps, this monastery, uh, it, right now it's not there, but Wanfu is very famous in Chengdu yeah. because in the 40s we excavated the Buddha statue, right? Yeah, yeah. Lots of the Buddha heads. So he's very famous for our historians, and they all know about this temple called Wanfu. Right? So, so well, yeah. the only thing we don't know is that if this Wanfu monastery is exactly the Wanfu monastery of this We, we have a historical records. Steve is all said they used to be uh, the Jingzhong temple. Mm -hmm. right? So we, at least from the text, we can say there's a lineage here, right? Jingzhong temple be changed to other names. And the first is Wanfu, actually, because the Buddha had been discovered. Mm -hmm. right? So people, Wanfu, Wanfu is very close in Chinese. So local people just call it Wanfu. But there is a, well, well when, when Zhang Xianzhong attacked Sichuan, yeah. almost all Sichuan people were massacred yeah. Yeah, in, the, uh, in the 17th century. So it caused huge damage, and Chengdu as a city was almost wiped out. There were only seven households, Absolutely. and the tigers and wolves could wander, would wander along the streets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about historical changes. There are lots of them. We right now what we propose is only hypotheses because mm -hmm. we don't have evidence. We need more evidence, and the sources are still there. Maybe there are new copies of Kaifa. By the way, in my previous lecture, I mentioned this discovery of a stele from Chongqing. Right, reading Wang Chang Shi Duan Jing Bei. Right, so there's an official higher Buddhist monk who reads this canon. Right, so that's exactly happened during the period when Kai Bao was created. Right? But I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure it's not Kai Bao canon they read. Uh, but that represents a local uh, canon, canon tradition alive in Sutra. Okay, I have uh, another question from our online audience. The giving of the Kaibo Canon as a gift to various states is indicative of attempts to have less antagonistic state-to-state -state relations. So would you say that Buddhism was an important vehicle of state-to-state -state relations at that time? So I think uh, right now I tend to agree with this uh, online audience. Uh, yes, we see Buddhism uh, is a safe, Gift. Uh, if you want to send something else, probably people have uh, uh, different opinions. But Buddhism uh, at that time is a shared bond among these uh, East Asian countries. Right? So uh, uh, people accept that, uh, accept this, and indeed, uh, the creation of Kaibao Canon helped to elevate the, the status, international status of Song Dynasty. So Song has been looked upon as a superior state, superior state with cultural uh, achievement, and Taibao is one of them. And, and, and other people, uh, other people in our other nation try to imitate such achievement by creating their own. So then we have the uh, uh, Golden can Canon, for example, right? as one example. So you just mentioned that the, the uh, production of Kaifao edition is sort of to elevate the international status of yeah, Song yeah. Dynasty. And then, so, so did you ever make a survey on the, uh, the distribution of this Kaifao edition? I mean, to, to, to which audience? What What's its main audience? And then, a monastery and among the lay Buddhists of the ordinary people, they got an access to this. They have copies of that. And also, the final question is that, um, say that if the motive of making the uh, Kai Bao edition is to elevate the status of this dynasty or this emperor, so 
Would that in the following dynasties or following emperors who, who donate or who financially sponsored the, uh, the creation of a special edition, would, that, would this Kaibao edition set a model for those emperors? Uh, so so we're, first we've talked about international relationship, right? So Kaibao was a new thing at that time. But in a later time, it's not the new because uh, the, the, the Koreans, they, they have a copy, and the Japanese actually went to Korea to get a copy. So they, 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 of, of course, they're still interested in Chinese copy, but however, uh, the Chinese canon sponsored by the court, for example, largely in the later time, are designed for uh, domestic consumption. Uh, we don't see uh, in the later time in such a way that a canon has been given as a gift to elevate international status. And the China, to tell the truth, Song Dynasty is one perhaps military weak dynasty. So they need something else to elevate their status. If you come with Qing Dynasty, who cares about canon? They have a military force. If you don't come to us, we will invade you, right? So only when you see a dynasty relatively weak or need to use this kind of a tool to maneuver their relationship, then this kind of a cultural product become very prominent. Uh, in the later time, Ming Dynasty, yes, we, we, we have records sending the cannon to Vietnam, but it doesn't matter that much for people at that time. Right? But the Song Dynasty appears to be uh, this is new, and the people want that. Right? There's a demand there. And for the survey, I, I, it's really difficult because we don't we have a historical records, but exactly how people use that I already mentioned putting the revolving device, and also people read that for their ceremony, right? So we, we next time when we discuss the Korean uh, canon, we know in a Korean court. The Tripitaka assembly was very often being convened, and the people, monks, read scriptures, and there were complaints about the scriptures all worn out. So that scripture, very likely, if, if they're doing the entire canon, then that's Kaiba. It's supposed to be Kaiba. So there's a great need to create new ones, which you can print out of that and supply the worn out uh, uh, scriptures. So those scriptures are absolutely being used actually be used in temples. in temples. But however, because it's so rare, the Song Emperor only gave you eight copies. So ordinary people most likely won't be able to get access. But for the learning monks, the emperors, kings, of course, they, they, they can use that for their ritual purpose. But in those days, the printing industry already starts well, they're, they're indeed, right? There are other editions, by the way. Right? We're talking about in the southern part, there are even more editions, one after another. So, so when there, whenever there's a, a new demand, then there are going to be somebody to initiate a new project, to create a new canon. So there are multiple canons circulated, multiple canons circulated. Well, when we check the Shisha, uh, Shisha probably sent an envoy to Song Dynasty and asked for the Buddhist canon. And the Song court said, send me 80 horses. So it's, uh, well, uh, for business. commercial use or, well, Shisha people, I think are probably Shisha people were bilingual. So they, <laughs> they probably had their own language. It's a good and business, also, right? It's a good business, and also we could figure out that they, certainly they have close contact with the Chinese the, in, in Central China, so they probably understood Chinese language, they could read Buddhist canon, and they need Buddhist canon, they send envoys to China for Buddhist canon. Yeah. And, uh, well, the song said, well, it's, it's well, it's costly, and ask them to send horses. Yeah. So it's an exchange, not free. Yeah, not free. Right, not free. You have to pay. Right. But it's good business. I like that. And put this cannon for eighty horses. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, we, I can easily find that uh, yeah, source yeah. from the. Well, we probably we probably have to check those sources in the uh, history of the song or or the yeah.
We need horses. Why horses we mentioned? Horses are very important to the Chinese. Yeah. Because you see the Song map. Basically, the Song lost all their major supply of horses. And horses are important for the battlefield. In the military, okay. military campaign, you want to receive the, the, the tribal people from the north. If you have no horses, you're, 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 you're dead. Right? So horses has become so essential for the Song dynasty. They lost all the major supply areas of horses, and they, they, they just want horses. Right? So in this case, cannon for the horses. Right? So that, yeah, that's yeah. a good yeah, trick. Cannon, not, not that kind of yeah. cannon. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, and, and another sub, uh, kind of stable Chinese use is tea. Right? Chinese use tea to trade for horses. The Tibetans want tea, uh, tea but uh, Chinese tea supply them, and Chinese trade for the horses. So the horse is very important for Chinese. Okay, so if there's no further question, we can conclude this lecture. Thank you for coming. And tomorrow, uh, we have uh, last two lectures. Start from what? Seven? Six. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay.